Well, yesterday I hope that you understood most of what I said, because sometimes when I'm speaking English, I keep praying for people who are listening to me, <laughs> because there is, you know, I don't want to, can I get, well, okay. I, I, I don't want to get into a situation like this. Hello, technology. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das, das Überlebensradar. It can happen. So I hope that when you listen to me, nothing like this is happening. <laughs> because if we have miscommunication like this, very bad thing can happen. So, <laughs> so this, this morning we uh, would like to share about uh, joining God where he's at work. And joining him and doing what he's doing. Uh, it is very important because in John 6, verse 44 and 45, Jesus said clearly that no one will come to him unless the Father draws him. Uh, and this is very important because for me it means that I can go in any community, I can do a lot of things, I can teach, preach, do everything. But if God is not at work, nothing will happen. I, I can be very eloquent, I can be, you know, great speaker uh, that I am not. But if God is not at work, we will not be able to see disciple made. Uh, in some places, maybe we can have some clubs that we will call church, but there will be no disciples. And what we want to do is to, to make disciples. You know, if you make disciples, you will get a church anyway. But if the focus is to have church, meaning to have people who have raised their hands, their hand and say, okay, I want to follow Jesus because they have seen some miracles or they have eaten some food. Uh, well, you can have something you call church, but no disciples. So what we want is to have disciples. So we want to see God drawing people to Christ. We want to see God touching life and bringing them into the kingdom. And what Jesus said is that it is God who will teach them. And the way he does it is through his words. Because he says that he will, they will be taught by God and everyone who has heard and learn from the Father, come from him. So if they hear the word of God, and they learn from the Father, this is how the Father will draw people to Christ. Well, it seems that this device doesn't agree with me this morning. Okay. So then... The question for us is, okay, if it is God who is drawing people to Christ, what is my role as a disciple maker? What is my role 
as a missionary, what is my role uh, in, in that process? One is, I need to find out where God is at work. Because the idea is to join him so that he can use me. So I should find out where is he at work. And we do that, I will talk more about that, but it is a lot of prayer, and then engage in the communities, and look for the person of peace. Because the presence of the person of peace is the proof that God is at work in that community. Two, oh no, see too fast. <coughs> now, when I find the person of peace, God will, God will use his word to draw people to Christ. So what I, I want to do is to expose the person of peace and his social network to the word of God. So that they will listen to God directly. So that they will hear from him directly. And we do that through what we call Discovery Bible Studies. And I will talk about that more. And then three, while I'm doing that, I trust God that he will do what he said he will do. To speak to them through his word, to touch their heart, and to draw them to Christ. So when I start Discovery Bible study with the person of peace and the, uh, his social network, I have started the process of disciple making. And then that discipleship will lead people to come to Christ. So it is discipling people to conversion. Uh, I remember when I came to Christ, uh, I had uh, classes for new believers. And then I had uh, classes for baptism. And then uh, one day, uh, Sunday, I said, okay, we will start a discipleship classes. And people who want to be disciples, uh, register yourself. So I went and put my name on the list. We had 12 classes. It was every Sunday. At the end of the 12 classes, well, I had memorized more than 60 verses, and I can discuss, debate, explain uh, some theme like what is sin, what is repentance, what is this, what is that. And then uh, another Sunday, uh, people who took that class were called in front, and then we were given some certificates that we have become disciples. So at the end of the service, well, we did, we had some pictures. But what I learned and what I was practicing was a big gap. So I was full of knowledge, but I was not taught how to obey the thing that I have been uh, received. So I can debate them, I can uh, quote verses, but when it comes to, okay, how this is playing in your life, uh, so, okay, there's a problem there. So, knowledge based discipleship. Uh, will not bring transformation. Uh, in, in Matthew 28, Jesus said to make disciples and to 
teach them to obey. You know, knowledge without obedience will always put us away from God. Well, we have Adam and Eve. When Satan came to them, what did he say? God knows that if you eat that fruit, you will have what? Knowledge. God was expecting, they, they had knowledge because God has told them what to do and what not to do. So they had that knowledge. But instead of obeying that, they were looking for more knowledge. And what happened was there was separation. Knowledge without obedience will always separate us from God. So coaching and mentoring, you know, even from before the time people give their life to Christ, we should teach them how to obey. And this is embedded in the way you do discovery Bible studies. And we'll see that. So when people come to Christ, then you coach and mentor the new group of believers how to be and do church. So the Discovery Bible Study group become a church. And then the coaching and mentoring continue because now you have to develop leaders. You have to coach these groups how to uh, multiply themselves, how to reproduce themselves. Okay. Now let's go in... Um, Let's look at ten, uh, Luke 10, the instruction that Jesus gave to the uh, 72 when he sent them. We will not go uh, through all of that, but just some key elements. He sent them in teams. And what is interesting here, the Bible said that he sent them where he was about to go. It, it, it means that where Jesus is sending them, Jesus will be at work there. You know, for, for many years, I was reading this, and then I, I thought, okay, uh, there were places where he cannot go, so he's sending them. But when you read the report that this disciple gave, Jesus was not physically there. But I think the Holy Spirit was there. So Jesus was not sending them anywhere. He was sending them in specific places, in places where he is at work. This is why I said we need to find out where God is at work. He told them to pray. Again, you know, uh, we will not talk enough about prayer because prayer is essential in this process. So, if you want to see movement, you should pray. <laughs> and then Jesus told them to go as people who bring peace to the community. He said, in any house that you enter, say shalom. I think it is more than just greeting people. But when I go into a community, when I meet people and I say shalom, I say peace be upon you, it means that I'm someone who is bringing peace. 
So I, I'm a, not only a peace bearer, but someone who is bringing peace to, to the person, to the family, to the community. So the question for me will be, okay, this person I'm speaking to, this person or this family I'm having conversation with, are there things that are preventing peace to be in their lives? And what is that? And how can I help meet that need? And then he said, look for the person of peace. So when I have access to a community, and I go in as someone who is bringing peace, and I'm, I have identified some need, and I'm helping people to meet that need, while I'm doing that, I'm looking for the person of peace. And we will see uh, the example of the Samaritan woman. For a person of peace to reveal himself, because most of the time this is what happened, the person of peace in the community will reveal himself. You know, it will be easy if we, we go in the community and then uh, Jesus open our eyes and then we see on the front of people, person of peace, person of peace. Hey, it will be easy. <laughs> but when, as you help people, as you have conversation with people, you show yourself as a spiritual person. When people see you as a spiritual person, the person of peace will reveal himself by the question that you will be asking. We, I, I will give several uh, stories. Uh, right now, I just want us to go through the, you know, uh, the key element. So look for the person of peace. Jesus said, when you find a person of peace, stay. If not, you move on. It is very important to know that uh, sometimes we lose a lot of time in one community. We, we do a lot of things in the same community for one month, two months, three months, and nothing is happening. And then we keep doing it. We, we think that if we do more activities, we will see results. But if God is not at work, you will not see results. So what I, I tell our teams, say, okay, if you are visiting a community, let's say once a week, give yourself maximum three months. If you don't find person of peace, move on. Don't just give the name of the community to the intercessors. They will start praying. But go in other communities. And this is why I, I say, okay, I already have a plan for our teams. I say, the week, in the week you have five days. I say, okay, remove Sunday. And then find another day that you remove. This is for you and your family. You rest. You spend time with your wife, with your kid, because family is very important. So now you have five days remaining. And you should use these five days. Day one, you say, okay, I will visit maybe two, three communities in that direction. Day two, that direction, etc. So in the week, you are visiting several communities. Are you following me? Yes, yes. I don't want to be like a German Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> So let's say the community that you are visiting the day, on day one, uh, well, if it is once a week, after three months, 
you, you don't find any person of peace to start discovery Bible study. Change. Visit other communities. But where you find one, then you start discovery Bible studies. So let's say your day one is Monday. And on Monday, okay, you used to visit three communities that direction. And then you are in one community you have found a person of peace. You start a discovery Bible study. And there is a lot of chance that this discovery Bible study will go on on Mondays. Maybe at the same time. But on Tuesday you keep visiting other communities. And then the day three, day four, day five. So a, a team of disciple makers, they can run simultaneously maybe three to five Discovery Bible studies. And they can start three to five churches at the same time. Because they plan their week. But if you spend your whole week visiting the same community, and then, you know, th there is a way to spiritualize that. Oh, the Bible said that uh, maybe my role is to come and, uh, you know, when you want to, the farmer, you have to till the soil, and then someone else will come and sow, and then someone else will come and, well, it, it is beautiful, but, sound very spiritual. But, well, I, I did that for several years and I was not seeing results. But when I changed to say, okay, let's look for places where God is at work and let's join him and follow his lead and doing what he's doing then we started seeing several churches being planted. How to find a person of peace? So, how to find out uh, where God is at work? The story of the Samaritan woman you know the story, right? So we will not. I asked you yesterday to read. But I know you, you have read this story many, many times. I think prayer again. You should pray. Before engaging communities, before engaging in conversation with people, before engaging families, prayer is very important. And then engage and meet people, meet the need. Let Jesus come, and he's sitting at the, near the well, and then that woman come alone at the well. Why is she coming alone? Because she's hiding from other women. Uh, she doesn't have a good uh, reputation in the community. So she's hiding. So she has a problem. She comes, and then Jesus engages her in a conversation. Say, give me uh, some water. And then what she uh, does is to, you know, rise all the social, cultural, religious barriers. You are a man, I'm a woman, why are you talking to me? You are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We are not supposed to speak, to talk together. So she is rising all the barriers. And then Jesus said, if you know who is asking you water to drink, you will ask him because the water I have, if I give it to you, you will not need to come back here again. Jesus just hit the need of that woman. If she can find a solution not to come to the well again and not to 
uh, risk of meeting the other woman, her problem is solved. So Jesus pointed right at a need that that woman had. How can I stop coming here? How can I stop doing this uh, uh, mouse and cat game? And then she said, oh, please, give me that water. Now all the barriers are down. She's not saying, why are you, why do you keep talking to me? I say you are a man, I am a woman. You are not supposed to talk uh, in public. So when Jesus hit the needs, all the barriers went down. She said, give me that. And then Jesus said, okay, go and call your husband. And then she said, I don't have a husband. And what Jesus said, Oh, in fact, you are five, and the one that is there is not yours. And what did she say? It seemed that you are a prophet. So now she's seeing this man in front of her as a spiritual person. It seemed that you are a prophet. And when she discovered that, she started asking spiritual questions. By the way, you Jewish, you say that we should worship in Jerusalem. We Samaritan, we say that we should worship where? On this mountain. What do you say? Spiritual question. And then when Jesus answered, she said, oh, uh, we heard that a Messiah is coming. What can you tell me about that? So that woman had spiritual questions. And when she came in contact with someone in whom she saw that he's a spiritual person, she brought up the questions. And when Jesus said, I am the Messiah. Well, <laughs> she was hiding, okay? She wanted to be alone, but she would run in the village and call everyone. Come and see, I have met with a man. Isn't he the Messiah? And all the people come and they listen to Jesus. You know, I, I think when people came and uh, uh, they were talking to Jesus and they uh, accepted the message, uh, I think she was going around and, uh, you know. And then what people said, it is not because of you, but we have heard ourselves. So she brought the whole community to Jesus and they listened to Jesus and they changed. Do you see the process? The, there are several stories of person of peace, and the Samaritan woman is, I, I like that story because it, it shows me uh, how I should engage a community, and what should I do so that if there is a person of peace, he will reveal himself. Show yourself as a spiritual person. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 9, you know, uh, God showed Israel how, you know, how to live. A very, it is a very simple spiritual life, a lifestyle that shows people that you are a spiritual person. You say, love God. We don't have time to go through Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 9, but read it and read it again and ask yourself, okay, how will I apply everything that 
he is said here. And when you do it simply, you will see that uh, in any community you go, people will see you as a spiritual person. You know, I, I don't know here, but uh, in Africa, uh, when you go into a community and you stay there for maybe a week or two, even if you said, you introduce yourself, you say, my name is Yunusa, in one week or two weeks, people will observe you and they will give you another name. It will happen. <laughs> you know how to find out that name? Speak with children. <laughs> because in their homes, when they are talking about you, they will use not the name you give them, but the name that they have given to you. And because the kids are listening, so ask them. <laughs> they will tell you. And by that name, you will know how the community sees you. And maybe you should leave or remain in the community. <laughs> so, one example. I met a, a brother. We were talking and then I, uh, I was asking about uh, his job, uh, his uh, workplace. And then he said, there are many people who are not Christian. I said, can you start a church? He said, no. He say, I say, why? He gave me a list of things that for him prevent him to start a church. One of them was he has never been into a Bible school. He doesn't have money and so on and so on. I said, you don't need all of that. So we talked and Deuteronomy 6 was the passage that uh, we discussed together. And then he said, no, I cannot do it. So, so he left. And then a few weeks later, he called me. He said, you know, sir, you know, sir, I have a group in my office that want to do Discovery Bible Study. How can I do that? And I said, oh, stop. You say you will not do it. And now you are saying that you have a group. Tell me what happened. And I said, okay, you know, I decided to try. So I just changed because I also told him that. When people ask you, how are you doing? Instead of saying, I'm doing well, thank you. What about you? Just change that answer. And in your answer, just let the person know that you believe in God. That God does think in your life. And God speaks to you. And you obey. It will take the same time that you used to say, I'm doing well, thank you, and you. It will take the same time. How are you? Oh, I thank God because God take care of me and my family. And then, short story. He said, I started doing that. It was awkward because uh, it was bizarre. So when people ask me, how are you doing? I would say, oh, I praise God. God uh, take care of me and my family. And by the way, when I was coming, there were very bad traffic. I thought I would be late. But I got in one place and God helped me to find a space and here I am on time. So God is good. And then one day he had his, uh, his car, the, the tire went flat when he was uh, coming. Uh, for people who know uh, the cities in Africa, when your car broke, on the road, just stop and you will see some kids coming from nowhere willing to help. So this is what happened. And that week, this was his story. Oh, you know, when I was coming, my, uh, the tire of my car went flat and uh, I, was, I didn't know what to do. And then suddenly I saw three kids. They just came and they say, okay, sir, can we help you? So they helped him, they changed the tire, and then he, he went to work. And then he said, God brought these kids so that they helped me. 
So he, he was using that in the office. And even people who used to not greet him, he will find a way during the day to go and greet them, <laughs> expecting that they will ask him, how are you doing? And then he will tell his story. And then he said one day he was sitting at his desk, and then a lady came, and then he said, you, every day God is doing this for me, God does this for me, why he is not doing for us? Are you the only one that God loves in this office? <laughs> and then he said, oh, no, God loves you, God loves everyone. So why, what can I do so that the thing that he's doing in your life, he will do it also for me? And they say, oh, you know, we cannot use the working hour to talk about that. If you want, during lunch break, we can have a quick lunch and then come back here and then we'll talk about that. And then she said, okay. And then he asked her, do you know among our colleagues here people who will be interested? And then she started pointing a finger to several people. You know, that lady there, she is always sad. She needs God. <laughs> I heard that this man is beating his wife. He should come and listen also. <laughs> and I said, okay, can you invite them? And then she said, I will try. And she went, invited them. And then he found himself with uh, six people, that lady and five other people who said they are ready to have a quick lunch, come back in the office, and then discuss these issues. This is how he started a Discovery Bible study in his office. And through the Discovery Bible studies, he brought many of his uh, colleagues to Christ. So it was just, you know, showing yourself as a spiritual person. Sometimes, yeah, I know here in the U.S., uh, say, okay, spiritual issue is private, so I don't want to. Yeah. No. <laughs> it is not private. <laughs> Let people know that you love God, that God does think in your life. In the Starbucks, around coffee, anywhere, engage people in conversation and let them know. Don't give track, don't give, you know, just conversation with people and let them see that you are a spiritual person. And then don't, don't, don't push, let them pull. Because when you want to push, this is when people say, oh, you know, uh, he's fanatic. He... But just show yourself as a spiritual person in conversation. And then wait. When a person of peace is there, he will pull, or she will pull. And then you follow the pull. When you get one, tell yourself that in any community, each individual has a network, a social network, starting with his family, his friend, his colleagues. So when you get one person of peace, you have access to a network in the community. And when the person of peace invites a person from his network, that person has also another network. The network overlap, but they are not 100% the same. So by following the pool of the person of peace, you will be accessing different social network in the community. But you have to let people see you as a spiritual person. And then, where God is at work, people will pull, and then you follow. So expect the person of peace to reveal himself. I would like to show a video here, but let me tell more stories. Um, 
there are a lot of them. I, when I say village, you know, it, it, it is not the same like what you call village here. So sometimes uh, finding the, uh, the stories to tell that will fit here. <laughs> um, in, in some of the places, what we have done is uh, to have what we call mobile shops. You know, in Africa, when you go in the rural areas, you will find uh, like a very vast area where there are many villages. And there will be one market that takes place once a week. And what happened during the week and during that day that the market is taking place, women will walk kilometers. Here you say miles. I cannot think in miles. I think in kilometers. This is why I have a problem with the GPS here. <laughs> say in one mile, uh, turn left. Say, okay, miles. Okay. <laughs> so this was a need. And these women will walk kilometers to just go and buy a little salt, a little sugar, you know, the thing that they used to cook. And then they will wait a week. And then we say, okay, what if the disciple makers, we buy bicycle for you? And then we put a box on the bicycle. And then the thing that these women are going to buy once a week, we buy some, we put that in the box, and then every day you go in these villages to sell. And then, you know, on the bike, there are always the thing that make cling long, cling long. We remove that. And then we put another one that does pahun, <laughs> pahun. <laughs> <laughs> so in the morning they will spend time praying and then they will take their bike and then they will visit villages and when they get into the village and then usually it is the kids who come and because they are selling something they can stop at each house each home and while they are selling, they are showing themselves as a spiritual person. They are engaging people in conversation and letting people know that they believe in God and God does thing for them. And in one case, one of the brothers went in the village and a woman was buying something and then he saw a girl laying down, and then he asked, oh, what is wrong? And I said, oh, she's, she's sick. Since yesterday, uh, her, she has a very high fever, and we have done everything we can, and uh, the temperature is still high. And then he said, oh, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to pray for her. I would like to ask God to heal her. And then they say, oh, we have done everything we can. And uh, uh, she even said, we have prayed. Well, it is not only Christian who pray. The Muslim also pray. <laughs> and I remember when I was still young, when, I, when I'm sick, when my brother or sister, one of them is sick, my father will lay hand on us to pray. So laying on hand, it is not only Christian. So she, he insisted, and then she went and called her husband. And then they discussed, and they said, okay, yes, do it if you want. So he went and just kneeled near the, that girl and simply asked God to heal her. He, he, he prayed simply, Lord, you are God, you created her, and you know what is happening, so please heal her, remove the sickness. And then he 
took his bike, and then they said, that is all? And they said, yes. Uh, they were disappointed. They thought that he will, you know, come and, uh, I don't know, do something, magic. <laughs> so he left, and then the following day, when he came in the village, he went straight to that home. But before he got there, the woman has heard the pankun pankun, so she came out to meet, to meet him. He said, you know, yesterday, uh, when you did what you, <laughs> when you did, what you, uh, did she rise up and she said she's hungry, she wants uh, water to drink and food to eat. And by the way, this, she's playing with her friends. So is it the word that you said that healed her? And I said, no, no, it is the person I talked to who healed her. When she was talking, the husband came, he was also amazed that just kneeling down and say, God healed this girl, that she was healed. And a discovery Bible study started in that home. Because they wanted to know, okay, can you teach us <laughs> how to do that? I was in Ghana, in northern Ghana, a few weeks ago, and I heard a story of a, a, a missionary. He went into a community, a people group called Dagombes, and he, he was uh, an expert in agriculture. So he he, he did his own farm, and then he was helping uh, other communities. And while he was doing that, uh, he, he, he will make sure that people know that he is someone who pray, who pray to God. And then one day, a chief of one of the community came to him and said, well, we are very grateful that you are helping us and our farms are doing well. Uh, but we have also seen that you, you pray. So can you teach us the way you pray? And then he just, he said, okay, I will do that. But the condition is that when I come, you call uh, the community so that it will not only you who will benefit from that. So he will come, and what he did was to take the, uh, uh, the Lord prayer, and then he goes uh, through that for several weeks. And by the time he finished, he had started, uh, I think it was 80 groups in different communities. And now these 80 churches exist. Now, when, when I was talking with the leaders who are there now, I think the problem they had was they did not build in that the DNA for reproduction. So these 80 churches have become a denomination and there is nothing else. But what this man started was powerful. Just to help people Show them that he's a spiritual person, and the person of peace came, say, I want that. And this led to starting uh, several churches. In cities, one of the things we use is tutoring, helping children at school. And while we are doing that, we have contact with the families. So we will visit the families to talk about the children. And while we are doing that, you know, we let people know that we believe in God. Uh, one day, uh, my last boy, who, who is 12 now, but uh, this was three years ago, he went to play at the park uh, we, we always teach our kids, if you are playing with your friends and one insults you or hit you, don't reply. 
just move. And then one day he came, and we found out that he has fight with someone, one of his friends. And uh, that friend was bleeding. So I said, why did you do that? He said, no, that, you know, uh, I want to play basketball. And he came and he took the ball from me. So I left him. I went for soccer. And then he came again, he took the ball from me. So I didn't know what to do. And when I said, no, you took this. I want to keep this one. And then he hit me. And he was near me, so I don't know what happened, but my head went like this <laughs> and hit his nose. And then uh, my wife said, well, you know, because you have done this, you know what to do. And then he said, yes, I will go and ask uh, forgiveness. So he said, I will go with you. So they go, and then uh, uh, they find the parents, uh, and then my wife explained what happened. And uh, so they came so that he will ask the child uh, forgiveness. And then the parents said, oh, the kids are always fighting. Why you take time to come and say that he should ask for forgiveness? This is... <laughs> But what happened was, a few days later, that woman came in our home and told my wife, she, she started opening her heart to my wife, the problem she was going through, and asking my wife if she can help, uh, what kind of advice 